I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is dollar sign watchman 1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Welcome to the Watchman YouTube channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke 21:25. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. One of the many signs we are living in the last days right before the return of Jesus Christ is nations will be in a state of perplexity or uncertainty over what to do in a difficult situation. This is exactly what is happening in our world today. A small 30 peso increase in the metro fare was the detonator of a social explosion last year that has rocked Latin America's most stable democracy ever since. The initial revolt was followed by riots and looting. Small but violent radical groups destroyed millions of dollars worth of property. Mainly peaceful demonstrations lasted until March when the pandemic began. Despite widespread human rights abuses on the part of security forces. But most of all, the social explosion, as it's called here, unmasked a deep-rooted discontent and anger over social inequality, privilege and exclusion in what was supposed to be a Latin American oasis. As a result of the uprising, the political establishment agreed to a key demand, a new constitution that will presumably guarantee basic social rights like education, health and decent pensions. Next Sunday, Chile will hold a referendum that is widely expected to approve the rewriting of the constitution. But with the country's democratic institutions so discredited for so many people, there's no guarantee that the genie can be put back in the bottle. They use Haiti's Independence Day to protest once again against their government. But what started off with a carnival-like atmosphere soon turned violent. Police use rubber bullets and tear gas against the demonstrators calling for President Juvenel Moise to step down. Protesters blocked roads and set fire to ties in the capital, Port-au-Prince. They started protesting last year against corruption, mismanagement of aid money and a rise in inflation. A majority of Haitians live in poverty. The president has been criticized for his handling of the coronavirus pandemic and denies allegations of corruption. I am in the street to demand justice for the underprivileged masses. That is my demand. We are from the poorest suburbs. We are saying that we can no longer live like this. We are out on the streets to demand justice. But Haiti has been in political crisis as well. Nel Maiz has been in power since 2017. But because legislative elections were not held in October last year, there has been no parliament. In September, Maiz announced the formation of a new provisional electoral council. But Haiti's opposition refused to participate and rejected its legitimacy. So with no parliament sitting, Maiz has been governing by presidential decree since January, giving him enhanced powers. The international community has called for an end to the political impasse and for a parliamentary election to be held as soon as possible. The government blames violence and the pandemic for delays to the election that was meant to be held last year. The UN has accused it of failing to protect people against human rights violations, with armed gangs controlling around a third of the country. In June, the president announced a legislative election in December, but the opposition has called for a transitional government instead. Failure to hold elections before Maize's term officially ends could leave Haiti without a leader or parliament. The determination to fight for political change is still alive. It's been a year since what some Lebanese call a revolution was born. Samira El-Azhar says she hasn't left the streets 
Economic hardship was what triggered nationwide protests. It turned into a revolt against what many call a corrupt ruling elite that has been in power for decades. We're not going to stop before uh, uh, these people in power just leave. And uh, we will make sure, basically, that uh, uh, we, we do this uh, change and push them uh, to, to resign in any way because we will not go back uh, to before uh, October 17. The leaderless and spontaneous movement was a turning point in Lebanon's history. Sects came together in this divided society. And for the first time, people rose up against their leaders in traditional strongholds. But the numbers weren't enough. They were up against a sectarian-based power-sharing system. This bridge, one of the capital's main arteries, came to symbolize that battle. The bridge was a front line between those calling for change and supporters of sectarian parties protecting the status quo. The largely peaceful movement faced a counter-revolution. The ruling elite called the protesters foreign agents. Security forces clamped down hard on gatherings. They made arrests and there was intimidation. Meanwhile, the economy continues to collapse. People are hungry and more sink into poverty. Politicians who have blamed each other for the crisis are promising much needed reforms, but they first need to agree on a new cabinet. The government resigned after the explosion at Beirut port in August that killed 200 people. It was blamed on negligence by officials. There is no conscience, there is no responsibility, there is no accountability. And as you can see now, life continues on for them and they're back to their old ways as if none of us exist. That is why people have returned to the streets. They insist on being heard. Their peaceful resistance wasn't able to remove those entrenched in power, but they are keeping their resistance alive. Protesters are back on the streets in numbers bigger than before. On foot and in their cars, despite concessions from the government, clogging the streets of cities already notorious for gridlocks. They've been demonstrating for more than a week and have vowed to stay on the streets for as long as it takes to achieve their objectives. Obianuju Elonya's brother was taken by officers of this corrupt police unit, the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, or SARS, 12 years ago and hasn't been seen since then. She says what they're asking for are more than the changes government has offered. Give us justice for people who have lost their loved ones to SARS brutality. The IGP should resign because obviously he doesn't have a control of the police force. The police force do not listen to him. So if you cannot control what is under your control, then you, are not, you don't have any business being there. And we also ask that all peaceful protesters be released immediately. In some states like Lagos, some protesters have been freed when the governor intervened. For a second consecutive day, protesters are back on the streets of the capital, defying an earlier government ban on street protests. What we see here is being replicated in cities right across Nigeria. Security services have so far shown restraint, but what is not clear is how long will that be. As the demonstrations gather momentum, protesters' demands also keep changing. We are asking that our elected leaders, people who we put into power, to be accountable to us, to be reformed, to act accordingly. That is the only way they can have the guts and the courage to hold the police accountable. Abuja, like many other cities in Nigeria, is bracing for more of these disruptions. For now though, the police are allowing them to continue. They begin spontaneously in small cities across Venezuela. Protests like this one are spreading throughout the country. People demanding access to basic goods like food, water, electricity and gas for cooking. Protester Mary Misler says over 1,000 families here in Los Teques, just outside Caracas, have been without gas for three months. We see the police comes here to try to force us to leave the protest, but nobody comes to solve our problem. They come and tell us they will try to solve it, but they don't do anything. We will continue protesting. It's the only way we have. And they're not alone. There have been over 7,000 protests in the country in the past month. Years of corruption, mismanagement and economic sanctions have decimated the oil industry this OPEC's nation main source of income. 
The government is finding it difficult to provide gas, water and fuel to its people because infrastructure is crumbling across the country. A month-long coronavirus lockdown is complicating the economic situation even further. For many, it's too late for protests. They're seeing a future across the border. And even the worsening conditions in neighboring Colombia have forced many Venezuelan migrants back to their homeland. Others, like Jairis Colmenares, are determined to try their luck. Whoever is living in Venezuela right now doesn't live off a salary. They live off what people send them from abroad. That's a reality for Venezuelans. My children know that when we have to use the bathroom, we go to the bushes and we sleep on the floor. If we're out on the highway, we always try to be at a checkpoint to be a little protected by the police and guards. The United Nations says that over five million people have left the country in the past four years. People responding to a dire economic reality. And while some want to stay and fight for a better future, others decide to move on. Thousands of people once more took to the streets of the Belarusian capital Minsk on Sunday as ongoing anti-government protests showed no signs of fading away. The march has become a weekly occurrence since the disputed electoral victory of President Alexander Lukashenko on August the 9th. Similar rallies are held across the country, but the protest in Minsk is always the largest, attracting up to 200,000 people, say organizers. News agencies reported that a number of people were detained at Sunday's rally. The demonstrators are demanding that Lukashenko, who has been in power for over 25 years, step down. But he's refusing and has threatened that security forces could open fire on protesters. Leading opposition candidate in the August election, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, claimed victory in the poll. Afterwards, she fled to Lithuania under pressure from the regime. Anti-government protesters in Bangkok defied an emergency decree and the police cracked down the night before to come out onto the streets again on Saturday. Undeterred by police moves to shut down the centre of the Thai capital, they split into three groups. To the north, east and west of the city they gathered and called for the government to step down and the monarchy to reform. Earlier in the day, the police announced that public transport to the centre of Bangkok would be stopped and roads closed. Anyone found to be participating in the protests, they said, would be arrested and charged. We have been constantly telling them that gatherings are prohibited because they are illegal. It doesn't matter whether the protests are peaceful or not, they are considered illegal. But the police were outmaneuvered again. Mobilizing on social media, the protesters just reassembled elsewhere. This group of engineering students had come prepared for trouble after seeing the water cannon and other police tactics the night before. There are rumors that the police would arrest people right away, without forming a line or pushing us or dispersing us. They will arrest us. I'm worried, so I prepared these. As night fell, rumors swirled of an imminent police crackdown. At times, the crowds looked lost, with many of their leaders already detained. But the message to the government remained clear, that they wanted to step down. The protesters have now been out for four nights in a row, and each night they face strong opposition from the authorities. The expected crackdown, however, never came, and the protesters didn't push their luck. After occupying the streets for four hours, they packed up and drifted home. But their point had been made that they can and they will continue to fight, and it seems there's little the authorities can do to stop them. Government uprisings are now a daily occurrence in our world. People in just about every nation are protesting, rioting, and demanding their governments do a better job taking care of the people. A man, I believe, who is alive and well today, will soon come on the world scene, seeming to have all the answers, and he will bring a false peace to the nations of the world. Three and a half years after this man comes on the world scene, his true intentions will become known. He will bring war the likes of this planet has never seen. And with war will come famine, pestilence, and death. The Bible refers to him as the Antichrist, and he will be welcomed by millions of those on earth not taken with the rapture. Unfortunately, his true identity will be known soon to those left behind, but his true intentions are death, destruction, and control. What do we know about the Antichrist? The Antichrist has many names. The King of Fierce Countenance, the Prince who is to come, the Beast, the Son of Perdition, the Worthless Shepherd, the Man of Sin, the Lawless One. 
The first sealed judgment in the book of Revelation is the releasing of the Antichrist upon the earth. Revelation 6, 1 and 2 Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The Antichrist will be evil, yet appear as a savior. He will be outspoken and have great speaking ability. He will have a fierce countenance. The Antichrist will be extremely proud. He will not desire women. He will be a military genius. The Antichrist will be mortally wounded. He will be indwelt by Satan. He will come from a revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will control a one world government. He will control a one world religion. He will control a one world monetary system known as the Mark of the Beast. It is evident that planet Earth is in the time Jesus refers to as the birth pains. The world is seeing death destruction and despair at unprecedented levels. The events the world is suffering through right now, awful as they are, will only get worse. The Bible tells us in the last days, right before Jesus returns, there will be a time of severe distress this world has never seen or ever will see again, as we read in Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, just as it has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. This time of distress Jesus is referring to is called the seven year tribulation in which the inhabitants of planet Earth, who have rejected God and remain unrepentant in their sin, will face his wrath. These terrible judgments are pictured as seven seals opened, seven trumpets blown, and seven bowls poured out. The first four of the seven seals are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The book of Revelation tells us when Jesus breaks the first seal and the white horse rides, the Antichrist will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the second seal and the red horse rides, war will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the third seal, and the black horse rides, famine will be unleashed. When Jesus breaks the fourth seal and the pale horse rides, death and Hades will be unleashed. The Bible tells us 25% of the population of the earth will be killed at this time, as we read in Revelation 6, 8. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death, and Hades followed with him. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. The population of the world is roughly 8 billion, meaning 2 billion people will die during this time. The remaining 17 judgments of God include devastating earthquakes, cosmic disturbances, scorching heat, meteors, 100 pound hailstones, volcanic eruptions, loathsome sores on those who take the mark of the beast, the seas, rivers, and springs of water turn to blood, demons torturing mankind, and a 200 million strong demonic army who will kill another third of mankind, bringing the total to four billion. Jesus said, as a sign of his coming and the end of the age, there would be an increase in deception, false Christ who will deceive many, wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, Christian persecution, apostasy, false prophets, and lawlessness causing the love of many to grow cold. Jesus said all of these signs would come like birth pains. Jesus was likening last day's events to a woman in labor. As the labor progresses, the pains increase in both frequency and intensity until the baby finally comes. As we get closer to Jesus' return, all the signs he gave us as a sign of his coming and the end of the age will become more frequent and more intense. All of these signs are manifesting around the world in our time. A chilling new report warning the U.S. about China's vow to take Americans hostage if the DOJ doesn't drop its prosecution of Chinese scientists. The Wall Street Journal reporting, quote, the Chinese message has been blunt. The U.S. should drop prosecutions of Chinese scholars in American courts, or Americans in China might find themselves in violation of Chinese law. Here to discuss, Fox News senior strategic analyst and retired four-star General Jack Keen. General, thank you so much for being here. We're going to start with China, and then we're going to get uh, some comments on Iran and Russia as well. But it, what, what the U.S. is saying is that these scientists concealed from immigration authorities their active duty status with the People's Liberation Army. Army, therefore, we've detained them. Should we take seriously that China will uh, will do the same to Americans? Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Well, first of all, this was so-called visa fraud. These are actually research scientists, as you indicated, associated with the People's Liberation Army, here to do what? To spy. They're here to yeah. conduct espionage. They got caught at it, and they've been arrested. China wants to retaliate. They, they've done this kind of retaliation uh, with the Canadians right now. They got two of them arrested for a Canadian, uh, for a Chinese uh, executive from Huawei who they have arrested. 
and they also have done it with the Australians and the Swedes. The difference is we're arresting spies. What China will likely do is detain Americans who have done nothing. Yes. They are not guilty of anything. So in that sense, it's not like the Cold War with the Soviet Union. We arrested their spies, they arrested ours, and we exchanged them at some point. So yes, when you started out, Pete, and said they're hostages, that would be an appropriate description of what the Chinese intend to do. It's such a demonstration of the rule of law. Of course, they're in violation, so they're arrested over there. That doesn't matter. They'll find any reason whatsoever uh, and certainly could escalate the situation between us and China. But I want to get your, your take on Iran as well. There has been a UN, a UN arms embargo, meaning you can't sell tanks, you can't sell uh, fighter jets to Iran, that has now expired under the, the Iranian nuclear deal that we pulled, the President Trump pulled us out of, but the world is still attempting to recognize. Why did this, why was this allowed to expire for Iran and what will it mean? Yeah, this is another flaw in that so-called JCPOA or nuclear deal that the Obama administration uh, entered into with, with Iran in 2015. It meant that in five years, here we are, 2020, five years mm -hmm. later, the, the nuclear, I mean, excuse me, the weapons embargo uh, that was imposed is over. And it, it means that they can't sell and they can't buy. And as you said, all advanced missiles, tanks, airplanes, et cetera. The reason why the embargo was there is because Iran's behavior, aggressively and malign behavior, destabilizing the Middle East, war in Syria, war in Yemen, using uh, Iranian-backed proxies in Iraq, attacking Israel through Syria on a regular basis using uh, rockets and everything. The, the fact is, that behavior is what the embargo was trying to stop. And the nuclear deal has now, because it is so fundamentally flawed, the nuclear deal is permitting that arms embargo to go away. And the United States tried to do something about it, mm -hmm. Pete, went to the U.N., tried to get a U.N. resolution passed to extend the deal, which made sense, and that resolution failed. So here's where we are, and, and that's a fact. The Iranians are strapped for money, though. Yeah. So they're not going to be able to buy a lot because of the, UN, uh, the U.S. sanctions that are imposed on them. Russia and China are the likely candidates to sell to them, for sure, as we go forward. Unbelievable. Uh, speaking of Russia, the, the, the White House has rejected Vladimir Putin. He responded to the U.S. nuclear arms proposal that was negotiated under the Obama-Biden administration. So where are we on missiles and whether or not we should be in an agreement with Russia and why does it matter? <clears throat> well, this is the START Treaty, and this, this is a treaty that restricts the number of, number of nuclear weapons that the United States and Russia can have. And it's a treaty that makes enormous sense and helps to maintain stability in the world. The restriction is odd numbers, about around 1,700 each. And what are we talking about? Uh, ballistic and submarine missiles that deliver nuclear weapons out of silos and submarines, also air-delivered nuclear bombs from our strategic bombers. That's where the restriction is. And what we're trying to do is, is extend it another five years. Mm -hmm. The United States thought we had a deal over a week ago, Pete, when our negotiator said, listen, the Russians have agreed at least to a framework, not signed a deal yet, but to the framework that will extend the treaty a year and they will freeze all nuclear weapons development. Uh, within 24 hours, the Russians came out and said, that's a fantasy. So something happened there. Speculation is Putin got into this, said, no, I don't want to do that. And further speculation, that's all it is is that he didn't want to give uh, President Trump a, a huge political victory uh, close to the election. Tonight, one national security expert is sounding the alarm about a growing threat to our country. CBN national security correspondent Eric Phillips explains. Bradley Bowman leads the Center on Military and Political Power at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. He tells me how in the past, political division in the U.S. carried little to no consequence to national security. But that time is not now. This is scary what we're doing right now. By our own divisiveness, we are making ourselves less safe. Military analyst Brad Bowman believes the current division is unprecedented and the implications stretch well beyond our borders. Russia has been trying to hurt and divide democracy, uh, American democracy, since the 1920s. So this is not new. What they most want is they want to pit the extremes against each other. So, you know, they want to pit the far right against the far left. 
and so that we tear each other apart. They want to say that our authoritarian model, their authoritarian model is better than ours. Look at America, look at that horrific debate. They can't even talk to each other in a civil way. Look at the riots, look at the violence. Um, and so we really are playing right into their hands. Bowman says diversity is America's greatest strength, what he calls its center of gravity. It's why he's critically concerned. The uh, scary divisions that we're seeing in my view, along racial lines, economic lines, party lines, um, to me, our, our, our adversaries, particularly Russia and increasingly China, uh, view as a, uh, an opportunity to attack as our, our center of gravity of unity. Your political adversary is not your enemy. And if that's the way you think, you're helping Putin more than you're helping our country. And I think you need to hear that directly. Bradley points to Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election and further alleged interference now in 2020. But he says that's just one example of how the cancer of division spreading in our land leaves us more susceptible to outside influence. Unify your team, divide the other team, and that's how you win. And uh, gosh darn it, we're dividing our own team right now. We can't be our wor own worst enemies. We should not do Vladimir Putin's work for him. The United States is divided on just about every issue, race, gay marriage, transgenderism, abortion, and the list goes on. Jesus said that a kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation as we read in Matthew 12, 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. My question is this, how much time does America have until it is brought to desolation? Psalm 917, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Fire emergencies threatening thousands in Colorado tonight. In Boulder County, the Calwood fire broke out Saturday. This is actually the biggest wildfire in Boulder County history. Fueled by high winds and dry conditions, it burned more than 8,000 acres in less than 24 hours, forcing the entire community of Jamestown to evacuate. I feel like I want to cry, just really emotional. This time lapse shows a thick plume of smoke growing on the horizon, consuming the sky and visible for miles. You just don't know what's going to happen. To the north, crews are gaining ground fighting the Cameron Peak fire burning since mid-August. It's already scorched more than 200,000 acres, now the biggest wildfire in Colorado's history. Fire season usually ends in the fall, but extreme weather is fueling the destruction, raising the risks for residents and those on the front lines. Jesus said a sign of his return would be more frequent and more intense weather, as we read in Matthew 24, 7 and 8. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Pestilence is the Greek word loimus, which means a plague. Definition of a plague is any large-scale calamity, especially when thought to be sent by God. God has used plagues in the form of extreme weather in the past and will again in the future. The seventh plague on Egypt was hail. Don't forget about the famine in Joseph's time. One of the biggest is the flood in the book of Genesis. In the future, during the seven-year tribulation, God will once again use extreme weather in the form of pestilence as judgment. In Revelation 16:21, God uses hailstones weighing 100 pounds each, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, God uses scorching heat. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire, and men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. So when Jesus Christ warns us that just before his second coming, there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places, you had better believe that these occurrences are a sign from God and that he is about to intervene. The Apostle Paul in his epistle to Timothy tells us in the last days society would be in a total immoral meltdown. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, 
and from such people turn away. News tonight about the deadly terror attack outside of Paris. Thousands rallying across France today, paying tribute to the middle school history teacher viciously murdered in the street. The suspect killed by police. Authorities now detaining 11 people, including family members, brought in for questioning. ABC's James Longman is in France. Tonight, a massive show of support in France for the teacher murdered in that horrific terror attack. Social distancing traded for solidarity from Paris to Nice. Outrage over Friday's barbaric killing of 47-year-old Samuel Patty, a father and middle school history teacher. They may have been wearing masks, but it was freedom of speech they came to defend. Thousands came out here in Lyon, where Mr. Patty studied to become a teacher. And tonight, we're learning new details about the investigation. Authorities arresting for questioning nearly a dozen people, including the parents and brother of suspected terrorist Abdul Haq, a Chechen immigrant. Police say the 18-year-old suspect followed Patty as he walked home from school and beheaded him in broad daylight. This cell phone video from Friday shows officers confronting the suspect. After lunging at them with a knife, he shot dead. Patty had received threats after teaching a lesson on freedom of expression and showing his class the controversial cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad that were published in the Charlie Hebdo newspaper. Their images many Muslims find disrespectful and that led to the 2015 attack on the paper's headquarters in Paris, which killed a dozen people. School officials say Patty asked students who might be offended to look away. Investigators say the suspect had no connection to the teacher. And Tom, tonight it's emerged that the sister of a parent at the school is suspected of joining ISIS in Syria. And that parent is among those who have been arrested. These problems run deep in France. John 16, 1 through 3. These things I have spoken to you, that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Service is the Greek word. Latria, which means ministration of God, i.e. worship. Muslims kill in the name of Allah, thinking they offer God worship. The Bible tells us they do it because they do not know the Father nor His Son, Jesus Christ. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. My God, what if his appearance occurs on a Sunday morning? My prophetic word to you this morning is get ready, get ready! The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive in faith the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about Jesus Christ and turning to God in faith for salvation. Turning from sin is not the definition of repentance. 
but it is one of the results of genuine, faith-based repentance towards the Lord Jesus Christ. Time is short. Accept Jesus today.